Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, I wish I could be with you in person, but these are the strange times. Um, I would like to share my screen with you now. <clears throat> <clears throat> so thank you very much <clears throat> for the opportunity to speak at the opening of this wonderful exhibition on Sinzendorf in America. Um, having had a sneak preview of the exhibits, I am deeply impressed by the quality of the panels, the choice of artifacts, and the design of this exhibition space, which invites visitors in to the simultaneously familiar and yet radically new storytelling of Zinzendorf's time in America. As we approach the 300 year anniversary of the founding of Helmhut, it seems appropriate to cast a closer look at the Moravian church's beginnings in North America and specifically Pennsylvania and New York. Before you, you can see the material objects that lead us to think about the role specific emissaries from Helmhut played in trying to realize Zinzendorf's vision of an ecumenical utopia of German immigrants to North America. And we can also look at his plan to convert the indigenous peoples in the creation of what he called his uh, Haydn Collegio. <clears throat> if you take a look at the superb travelogue that has been prepared on the map-based interpretive panel, it's obvious that Zinzendorf's approximately one year stay in North America was extremely eventful. With dramatic scenes from the Germantown Lutheran Church where Muhlenberg demanded the keys to the church and the books back from Zinzendorf to Zinzendorf camping on nests of snakes in the Wyoming Valley to his meeting with the chiefs of the Six Nations at the home of Konrad Weiser in Wilmersdorf to the high drama of the Pennsylvania synods, and finally, last but not least, to the founding of Bethlehem itself. Sinzendorf had a very busy time while he was here. But it's important to remember that Sinzendorf, his visit to North America had been prepared by other Herrnhut emissaries, who for a year before he arrived, met with the parties he intended to unite. These earlier ambassadors carefully created diplomatic relations based not on social status or on confessional theology, but rather rooted firmly in interpersonal connections. The Herrnhut had chosen for this task needed in Sinzendorf's eyes to be able to communicate well with what he called the haughty and independent colonists who had responded the call to emigrate to America. <clears throat> Two of these Wortschaftler or emissaries came from the Nitschmann family, namely the 19 year old Anna Nitschmann and her carpenter father, David, whose family had left Moravia as refugees in 1725. Anna was well aware of the importance of religious freedom as hers was one of the families that had fled persecution. As a child, she had often taken food to her imprisoned father and brother and other heretics after they had been repeatedly arrested for practicing their hidden Protestant faith. And then in 1725, Melchior Nitschmann, Anna's brother, escaped to Bertelsdorf, after which the whole of the rest of the family followed. And as the story goes, they were some of the first to build the new settlement of Herrenhut. The story of persecution that then forced an escape to a new country for religious freedom would have resonated well with a panoply of nonconformists who made up the confessional landscape of early 18th century Pennsylvania. Two years prior to his departure to the North American continent, <clears throat> the decision was made at a conference in Ebersdorf to send Anna Nitschmann, her father David, Christian Fröhlich, and Johanna Molter ahead to pave the way for Zinzendorf's arrival in America. In July 1740, as this first set of ambassadors set out for London, and then their long journey ended on December 15th, 
1740, as they arrived in Philadelphia via New York. And from there, the group set out almost immediately to start clearing the Nazareth tract. During her time here in Pennsylvania, Anna wrote letters back to Benigna von Zinzendorf regularly. Here in this letter dated April 1741, Anna Nitschmann describes her activities among the peoples of Pennsylvania, a place that she says is a huge confusion and gar großes Gewirre of different sects and varying religious opinions. Despite her judgment of this Atlantic Babel, Anna sees that the people here are just waiting for salvation. She reports that in the three months since her arrival, she has already gathered 20 young women who are seeking the savior, and they are just waiting for the school that she and Benigna are to open. Although she lives with one of the Skipak brethren, actually works on his farm, she does go to Nazareth regularly. And there she notices the many young Lenape women who are watching her work. As she is clearing the land, she's then helped by them to carry wood and water. In her letter to Benigna, she writes, oh, if only you were here to work with them. And indeed, once Benigna arrives with her father's entourage, that's exactly what she does. Many of the other German sects settled in the province, such as the Brethren at the Ephrata Cloister, had already heard of the Moravians' arrival and subsequently came to visit them. And as we know, Anna's plan was to work with these disparate groups in the hope that her words, rather than those of a man, would bring them together in a truly Philadelphian ideal. Anna and her father thus traveled around Pennsylvania in the summer of 1741, visiting the Ephrata Cloister, the Brethren at Skipak, the New Mooners, as you can see from this map here. And then in November, Anna returned to Germantown in Philadelphia to set up the girls' school with Anna Margrethe Bechtel and to wait for Zinzendorf's arrival. Zinzendorf writes about Anna. When I arrived, I found that our Anna had become a true settler and a stiller im Lande. She had reconnoitered all the chiefs, examined the conditions of all religions, counted my and the congregation's enemies and found such a congregational host as I have never seen in the world. And one could say that the Lord has built him houses for this purpose. Her comportment has established her reputation such that it can never now be sullied for she is respected by all persons and recognized as a mother of Israel. As we see from the map-based interpretive panel and also from this sketch by Zinzendorf, Zinzendorf was one of the first European noblemen to travel through Indian country in the early 18th century. And he made three extensive forays into the back country, not one to rest with devising theories about missionizing native peoples, Zinzendorf engaged personally in negotiations and encounters with colonial agents, such as Konrad Weiser and Benjamin Franklin, as well as with the chiefs of the Haudenosaunee. Eager to establish his Haydn Collegia, he first had to seek permission from the Council of Chiefs to enter, work, and reside in the territories that constituted Iroquois. Diplomacy requires emissaries from both sides to meet and enter into dialogue. And one of the most prominent from the Haudenosaunee, who was to prove to be a great ally to the Moravians in the quest to establish missions in Iroquois was Shikalimi, an Oneida chief who had been sent by the Six Nations to act as a negotiator and diplomat. Um, he lived in Shimokan, which is today Sunbury, Pennsylvania, just down the road from me. Shikalimi, or the Swatani, as he preferred to be called, the light bringer, knew exactly what the Iroquois needed in return for the Moravians to gain permission to live and work in Iroquois territory, namely a blacksmith's shop to mend their weapons. But how could the Haudenosaunee convince the pacifist Moravians to build them a smithy and provide them with a blacksmith? Shikalimi negotiated this agreement with the Moravians, especially with Spangenberg, after the initial meetings with Zinzendorf. 
Once the allegiance of the Six Nations had been proclaimed in 1747, five years after Zinzendorf's visit, the agreement was drawn up whereby the Moravians could stay in Shemokan and practice their mission, as long as they did not A, allow traders to stay in their house, B, grow any crops other than the three sisters, beans, squash, and corn, and C, expect any payment from war parties from the Haudenosaunee on their way to war with the Catawba. These conditions were agreed to by the Moravians as they sat with Shikalimi and the other Haudenosaunee chiefs on a bearskin spread under a tree at the confluence of the Susquehanna River. The negotiations were conducted in Onondaga, the language in which the letters from Spangenberg had already been prepared. Spangenberg refers to himself in these letters in the third person and uses his Iroquois name, you can see that starting each paragraph here, to Gehatonti to communicate with his brother, Shikalimi. On hearing this, Shikalimi repeated his expressions of pleasure, both at the beautiful fathom of wampum that the Moravians had prepared for this negotiation, and also that these negotiations were conducted in Onondaga and the Moravians Onondaga or Iroquoian names were used. Spangenberg thus displayed his deep diplomatic understanding of the vital performative force that language assumes in an indigenous understanding of negotiations. These practices of diplomacy and negotiation bore fruit. The Moravian missionaries, most nice, notably Zeisberger, David Zeisberger, Johannes Hagen and Martin Mack, lived at Shemokan on and off for the next 10 years. And as promised, the blacksmith, Anton Schmidt, uh, lived there also with his wife, Anna Katarina, who was a direct ancestor of one of my colleagues at Bucknell, Kerry Perman. Uh, and the Iroquois was so happy to see Anton, they also gave him an Iroquois name, Rachwistonis, and he to build the smith. The, Heiden, the success of the Haydn Collegia depended on the mutual trust and respect for each other's cultures. Although Zinzendorf might not always have practiced such cross-cultural fluency in his dealings with Native Americans, especially the Shawnee of the Wyoming Valley, his deputies certainly did. Missionaries such as Zeisberger, who also had an Iroquois name, Ganusa Ratchery, Friedrich Kammerhof, who was Anunciate, Anan Margarita Jungmann and Janetje Mack, all of these her people had learned Mohican or Onondaga or the Munsi dialect of the Lenape language and thus demonstrated a cultural humility that was needed for successful communication across the cultures of North America and Europe. Linguistic and cultural fluency was considered a prerequisite for successful communication and was not seen to pose a threat to one's personal identity, Moravian or Lenape or Haudenosaunee. However, the forces of monoculturalism and monolingualism were soon to take over the political landscape of colonial America, as the increasingly racialized politics of the frontier threatened both metaphorically and physically the lives of those who sought to build on William Penn's vision of a peaceable kingdom. Even before Zinzendorf's death in 1760, the divisive forces of what has been called the world's first global conflict, the War of Spanish Succession, or in America, the French and Indian War, fed on the polarities of religious and racial difference. Zinzendorf's vision for the Moravian church in America was fundamentally challenged by the land grabs of settler colonialism and the concomitant eradication of Native America. So as we look through the wonderful material artifacts that represent Zinzendorf's presence in America, let us remember that for a short period of time in the 18th century, there was another vision for America, one that sought to recognize the diversity of peoples and languages and cultures and one that recognized the common humanity that binds us all together. Thank you. Enjoy the exhibition. <laughs>